Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, based on your time, John. Welcome in Salesforce Apex Hour. My name is Amit. I'm your host and the founder of the Apex Hour. And today's topic is Apex Performance Tips and Tricks. And we have a special guest, Paul, with us. Let me hand over to the Paul for his introduction and for the session. Hand over to you, Paul. Super. Thank you, Amit. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, welcome to the session. Uh, really, really pleased to have so many of you here and very excited to be share, able to share some uh, Apex performance tips and tricks. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Paul Batterson. You can find me on Twitter at P Batterson. Uh, I'm very, very consistent, so it's P Batterson everywhere. If you want to find me, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, I'm the COO at Cloud Galacticos, who are a UK Salesforce consulting partner. I've been working with Salesforce now for about 13 years. Um, across a range of different roles, um, mainly kind of technical as a developer, an architect, um, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm a Salesforce MVP and have been lucky enough to be one for about seven years now. Um, I have about 18 certs, and um, you may have found my name either through one of the two books I published last year, so Learning Salesforce Development with Apex for uh, those looking to start learning Apex and Mastering Apex Programming for those that are a little bit more um, uh, a little bit more up to speed with Apex already and wanting to get into some of the nitty gritty details. Um, <clears throat> some of the stuff we'll be talking about today is featured in that second book. So if you do want um, some more information, you know, you can always, if you're interested, pick that up. Um, I also have uh, a course on Udemy on Apex testing specifically, if you're so interested there. Um, and uh, you can find out some more about me at cloudbytes.tv where there's a bunch of YouTube videos and some more coming up soon. So that's enough about me. What are we going to talk about today? So today's session is all going to be about performance, um, as Amit mentioned. Um, and we're going to start off by talking about what we mean by performance. Um, before we can solve a problem, we have to know what the problem is and what we actually mean by it. We have to get some definitions sorted. So we're going to start by understanding what we mean by performance, we're going to look at how we measure performance and how we can actually track the performance of our code. And then I want to spend a bit of time looking at some examples. So specific examples for loop performance, SQL performance, caching, and also then dealing with asynchronicity and architecture. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get everything covered today. There will be a few bits where I'll dive into some code. Um, the code for this is, again, all taken from the repository for that book so I can uh, find the link at the end of this and share that as well. So let's start by what do we mean by performance? Um, and <laughs> there are three different things we can mean by performance. We can mean resource usage or code performance. So that is how many seconds are we taking? Um, how many DML statements are we using? How many of something are we consuming? And that's an extremely important metric for us because obviously we are constrained on our resources on Salesforce by the governor limits, but it's not the be all and end all. It's one aspect of what performance means. Another aspect is the user's perception of performance. So I often have conversations with um, developers where you know, they'll get very, very in detail and down in the nitty gritty about worrying around you know, saving an extra 10 milliseconds in a, um, in some Apex code or worrying very much about a small amount of uh, you know, heap size they're using or something like that. What we need to worry about is what the user perceives because at the end of the day, you know, for system to system integrations, yes, we wanna make sure we're focusing on raw numbers, but overall, we're more than likely to worry about what a user perceives our performance to be, okay? And that's a very important thing we'll come back to in a second. And then finally, we also might mean scaling performance. So how we scale as we have more users, more records and other different things. And so when we say performance, <laughs> what we have to keep in mind is there are multiple different aspects that we might be referring to when we say performance. And so it's very, very important for us when we start out looking to improve performance, we actually know what we mean by it and what we're trying to improve. If we just go in blind and say, I'm gonna make my code more performant, well, you know, you're setting yourself up for failure. It's very, very hard to measure something that's so abstract. So the first part of this, as I mentioned, is that kind of resource usage or code performance. 
And that's really focusing on minimizing the amount of resources we are used wherever possible. So a good example is queries, you know, not making as many queries, so reducing the number of queries, reducing the number of CPU statements all the time. You know, for those of us that have been around a while, there used to be a limit on the number of CPU statements versus CPU time you had in Apex. So just making sure that you're using your code in the most efficient way possible. It might be your heap size. It might be your DML statements. It might be the number of call outs you're making. But on a constrained platform, we have a set of constraints on there and we want to make sure we are using our resources as efficiently as possible. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're focused purely on the governor limits. We can use them as a guide, but it's focusing on how we're using our resources most effectively. If we could do something that might take one statement versus five statements, is that going to be more performant for us? Is that going to be a better use of our resources or not? We want to think about using the most efficient mechanism for doing something as well. And this might take the form of us doing some calculation to do some trick. It might require us to use a declarative feature to infer some data. So it might be that we have a cross object formula that saves us a query. What we want to do is make sure that whatever we're doing within our code, we're minimizing the amount of effort we have to put in to minimize the amount of work we're doing. If we can minimize that and leverage the standard Salesforce behavior, we're going to find that all of our work is far more performant overall. Now, theoretically, minimizing any of these things should make us more performant. However, the big caveat here is that when we're saying more performant here, we're worried about how our, um, sorry, let me just get rid of that notification. We're worried about how our uh, code is going to view our performance. So we're worried about how the system views it. We're worried about some numbers that we get at the bottom of a debug statement. We're not actually worried about whether or not the user thinks it's more performant, whether or not we as developers are more performant. Okay. One of the things we have to think about as well here is that if we write you know, some extremely complex single line structure, that might run a little bit faster and might make it a little bit easier for the system. But if it's going to take a developer 20 minutes to sit there and work out what it's doing every time, or if it requires you to have some sort of advanced degree in mathematics to figure it out, then it's probably not going to be making the rest of our development as performant as it needs to be. Okay. So one of the big takeaways you will get from this is that there's no simple answer. Um, and we are, I think, three slides in now, four slides in. And I want to make that very clear. Like, we're not going to get to the end of this session today. And you go, great, I've got a list of five things that I know I have to do every single time. That's not how this works. What we've got to do is make sure we're understanding what we're doing, what we're measuring, what we're trying to improve, and the impacts that has on other areas. So we've mentioned already the idea of governor limits. And governor limits are different from performance. Governor limits are a Salesforce construct that stop us from monopolizing resources. They're there to stop anyone acting in bad faith on the platform. They're to ensure that we have some hard limits, so that no one can surpass those limits and take more than their fair share. And so they're really about avoidance rather than a target. So I've got here 55 SQL queries versus 90 SQL queries. Realistically, it's not going to matter to you whether you have 55 or 90, because if they're quick enough small SQL queries, you'll get roughly the same performance. It is going to matter to you, however, that you don't want to surpass the 100 query limit. And so being at 55 is better than being at 90. Okay? So the limit there doesn't actually make anything more performant. It's there to stop you monopolizing resources. However, governor limits are an extremely useful way for us to look at our performance. Because Salesforce is so concerned with them, we have a series of methods that allow us to ensure that we're targeting the correct areas to improve the performance of our code. And so performance is very much about the way in which our code runs and uses resources. It isn't a limit that we're trying to avoid. It isn't a target that we've got to hit. It's an optimization problem and goal. And so I just want to make sure that we, everyone's kind of thinking this through in that you know, governor limits are there as, 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 as kind of a limit that we have to avoid. Whereas performance is there as a goal that we have to optimize. The two are very closely related, and we'll see that we're actually going to use the governor limits as our guideline, those resources, because those are the ones that matter and they do line up. However, there's an entire separate bunch of items that we can look at improving that will make our code more performant 
but aren't related to governor limits whatsoever. And we'll look at those when we get into things like cashew later on. Okay. So now that we understand what we mean by co-performance, what do we mean by user perceived performance? So user perceived performance is what the user actually experiences. It's, it's what their reality is. And the way I like to describe this is that it's CPU time versus heap size or UX versus technical improvements. So let's say that I have a piece of code, piece of Apex that's running, and <coughs> it is using, let's just say it's taking three seconds to run, and it's using 10% um, of the heap size allowance, okay? That looks okay to my end user, that runs fine. It's taking three seconds is not perfect. If I can lower my CPU time down to one second, but instead of using 10% of my heap size, I now use 80% of my heap size. Well, for the user, that's going to be perceived as far more performant, even though in the background, we're now using up another resource in a far greater manner. Okay. And so when we're talking about user perceived performance, we want that's what we want to really kind of be focusing on in a lot of the areas is we're thinking about what the user is going to notice. If I gave you two bits of code that ran at exactly the same time, however, one of them used 5% of the heap size and another used 95% of the heap size, you as an end user aren't going to know, nor are you going to care. Okay, You'll care when the governor limit is blown, which is why we need to be cognizant of it. But if you go to most of your end users and say, hey, have you noticed that's running a little bit faster? They'll go, yep, and they'll appreciate a CPU time decrease. But if you say to them, hey, have you noticed that we're using less memory in the background? They're not going to know. They won't be able to know. Okay? So we need to think about what our user is going to care about. And that's really got to be our guiding star in many instances. How is our user going to perceive the change that we're making here? And the final type of performance we might consider is scaling performance. So that's handling a greater volume of data and users. So it might be as our system grows and we add on more integrations or our integrations send across more records. Okay, so often you'll start with an integration with, say, uh, an e-commerce platform, and it's a brand new startup organization. They're doing 100 sales a day. You know, it's no big deal. It's fine. That startup then gets uh, goes viral on Twitter. They have an Instagram influencer. They you know, take a picture with their product. Um, product Hunt loves them. And suddenly they're doing 100,000 sales a day. Well, you need to be able to scale that. You need to be able to scale that rapidly and know how your code is going to perform under that load. It's also about reporting. You know, reporting is one of those things that is greatly impacted by the way in which we architect our code and architect our system. So you've got to think about things like sharing rules or by defaults, whether or not your code is using with or without sharing. Okay. So thinking about the way in which you're using your code for things like reporting, for sharing, and so on and so forth we we'll really also think about how your system scales as it grows. And then finally, searching. Again, you know, as your system scales and grows and you are searching with a social, uh, search across many, many different records, many, many different objects, how is that going to perform and how is that going to scale and grow? What do you need to do to help that work in the best manner possible? So the key thing I always want us to take away, though, is to remember to focus on the user. The user is the one that is paying for this. The user is the one that we've got to please, and the user is the one that, at the end of the day, is our customer. Okay? Whether that is a user at an end customer or a user that is simply a user uh, within our own organization, we want to focus on what's going to make them happier. And so if, for a sales user, if it means that they can close deals two seconds faster, they're going to be super happy with that. If it's a system-to-system -system integration and the user is actually um, ourselves or another uh, system administrator, they're going to care that we can scale properly. So find out who your user is and focus on making sure that they are happy. Okay, What are they going to perceive as a difference? So now that we understand what we mean by performance and what we're looking at, how do we actually measure this? How do we go about measuring and how do we go about evaluating performance within a system? And I like to use something called the OODA loop. So the OODA loop is um, something from the US military um, that they use um, to help them make decisions in the midst of a battle. Um, but I think it's quite nice and succinct. Um, I like the way OODA sounds as well, quite honestly. Um, and it stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, and Act. 
Step one, you're going to observe. We're going to take some measurements and observe our system under load or under different loads. Step two, we're going to orient. We're going to look at the data and make sure we understand what situation our system is in and what's causing that situation. Okay, Is it a particular statement? Is it a particular query? Is it some loop we're doing? What's causing our system to have that load change as we go? Step number three is to decide. Do we want to make a change to the system or not? Deciding not to make a change is a good decision. There are many instances where you'll go through, and hopefully as you get more mature doing this, you'll go through and you'll review your code and go, actually, it's running fine. We can't make anything better. Well done us. We've checked it. We've measured it. We're sure of that. We're going to decide not to act. Your decision may be to take some more data and go back to observing. Your decision may also be to take some action. And that action, you then go in, you change and update your code or change and update your measurements, and then you go back to observing as well. And by doing this nice cycle, it allows you to iterate over your code, check the performance, make the measurements you need to make sure that things are effective, and then make the changes that are actually going to make a difference. Okay. So for actual measurements, what we're going to do is we're going to look at three ways we can measure. The first of all, is to measure against our governor limits, okay? Second thing we're then gonna talk about is measuring using the limit methods. Now the limit methods very closely align with the governor limits, but whereas I say that governor limit is a target that we wanna make sure we're not hitting, our limit methods are gonna allow us to measure exact performance for us to look at changes. And then the final thing we're gonna talk about here is order analysis. And what order analysis is gonna do is it's gonna allow us to see how our solution scales and grows. So again, governors are not equal to performance, but governor limits act as a very useful guide for what we should be focusing on. And one of my key pieces of advice is, as you are testing your system, as you're going through things like UAT and systems integration testing on a build, you should measure against the limits during that testing. So as your users are going in and as they're doing their job, stick on debug logs, stick on some reporting and find out how your system is performing under load. Do a data load, see what happens, okay? Do an integration, see what happens as the integration is running. Make sure that things are working and make sure that you can measure against your governor limits. The big reason for this is that if they're gonna break, you want to know about it and you want to be able to take your measurements and understand it there and then. If you get a limit exception, I can tell you a limit exception is the worst exception you can receive on the platform. Um, in the 13 years I've been working with Salesforce, I must have received close to, I don't know, let's, let's go for a million different exceptions and errors. Like, you know, it's, it's the nature of developing is you get errors all the time. However, <clears throat> I will tell you that I have never had a limit exception at a good time. You know, when you're working away and you're developing, you're working with a couple of records, you're doing your data loading and testing, you're doing your work, but it's not real. It's you doing it in Apex. And so you're just kind of going through and you're doing your unit testing and you're doing your work there. The point at which you're going to get a limit exception is when you go in and you do your data load on your go live weekend, or you turn on the system for the first time against a production integration. That's when things are going to go wrong. And that is the worst time, obviously, because it's always high pressure. There's a bunch of people screaming at you. You have to figure out how you can fix it quickly. It's typically, you know, I know people say don't deploy on a Friday, but loads, loads of deployments still happen on a Friday. So I will almost guarantee you that if you're going to get a limit exception, if you don't test early enough on, you'll get your limit exception at 7.30 on a Friday evening on a go-live weekend after six months worth of work and it'll be the most stressful and awful time you've done, okay? You wanna get your limit exceptions early. You wanna do your testing thoroughly and get them early because if you do get them, you wanna be able to fix them before that big crunch time, okay? The other thing with a limit exception is you can't suppress it. You can't handle it. You can't, you can't manipulate it. You know, with something like a Sockwell exception, you could handle it, you could accept it gracefully, you could put out some error log somewhere, you could say to the user, oops, sorry, something went wrong. With a limit exception, it just goes bang. Okay, so you can't handle it. Can't handle it, can't recover from it. So 
Governor limits are going to be really key when we're talking about how we measure performance, because when we're running and doing our development, doing our testing, we want to go in, run a large data load, run with more records than you think a user's ever going to use, and test, test, test to make sure you're not going to hit it. Now, within our development, we're going to be using our limits methods. And when I say we're using our limits methods, for those who aren't familiar with them, Salesforce has a limits class. And in that limits class, there's a series of methods that allow us to take measurements on specific resources and how they're being used. Okay, So we can see how many SQL queries we have available. We can see or what the limit is. We can see how many we've used at any point in time. What we want to do is we want to measure both our usage as we're going through to see our scaling. And we can also measure against the total available limit. Now, when you're first starting out doing performance analysis, my advice is to always make sure that you're testing against both the scaling factor and the overall limit. As you get more experienced, you'll probably end up recognizing when you're gonna have a problem that hits the limit anyway. But we're gonna use these limit methods to take specific measurements as we go along in our development cycle. We're gonna write some apex tests. Those apex tests are gonna use those methods and allow us to verify how things are scaling and growing. I'm going to mention here we have what is a little bit of a Schrodinger's cat issue, though. So I'm sure everyone's heard of Schrodinger's cat, the famous quantum computing uh, experiment, thought experiment. No cats were harmed in the making of this presentation, I promise. Where take a cat, put it in a box with uh, a poisonous isotope with a half life. If after a certain amount of time that half life has passed, there's a 50 50 chance that the cat's been poisoned and is dead or alive. And so as an outside observer, you don't know until you open the box. And kind of the idea behind Schrodinger's cat is that taking, opening the box and taking the measurement affects the system. You've immediately destroyed that kind of state of unknown. Exactly the same is going to happen here. Running the statement that says how much of our CPU time have I used uses some CPU time. It's minor amounts and super negligible, but we have to be aware of it. Okay, so one of the things we can do is we can be aware of this. We can make sure that we're being consistent in our usage, and that will allow us to ensure that when we're being consistent in our usage, we're getting consistent results. Okay, there's no magic bullet we've got here where we can run it and then find out what that was later on. Anything we do, debug statements, you know, point of putting out logs, you know, anything like that, taking measurements, all has an impact. So what we need to do is when we're running our tests, we need to make sure that we're running them in a way that is consistent to ensure that we can take all this into account and have a correct answer. The final thing we would often look at doing is order analysis. So order analysis allows us to extrapolate how our solution will handle under load or scale under load. So what we would typically do is you would say, how many resources are we using for one record in this process? What if we up that to five records? How many resources are we using then? What about 10 or 100 or 1,000 records or 5,000 records? What does our system look like under these different loads? How are we scaling? Is it appropriate that we're going to scale this way? Do we have to instruct other people that there is a limit? We can then figure out at what point things break and go wrong and figure out if that's okay or not. If your system is going to be fine until you hit 10,000 records, but the main usage is through a user, uh, user interface, you're probably fine. If, however, it's through an integration, you may need to consider asking for data in different size chunks and batches. If this is going to allow us to determine if and when we need to act and how we need to keep an eye on the, user, uh, the system's usage. Now, as I mentioned before, when we discussed the UDA cycle, Deciding not to act is a fine decision. But what order analysis is going to do is it's going to allow us to make sure that we know what to monitor to act in the future. Okay? So if, for example, we do some order analysis and we discover that at, <coughs> excuse me, at 500 records, we're fine. At 1,000 records, things are starting to look a little bit less wonderful. Once we get to 1,500 records, the system is going to shut down. What we need to do is we need to monitor our system and make sure that we see when we're starting to increase our load up to that point and take action before that. 
Okay. That's a decision we can choose to make. It's a very valid decision to get our working code out. However, we need to be aware of that, monitor for that, and make sure that as we get to something like 800 records as our standard load, we're saying, okay, now we need to go in, make sure we're making this update and improve that performance or architect around. I've got this picture here that's taken from Wikipedia um, that <laughs> as part of order analysis, you may do something, uh, you may use something called big O notation. And it's something I mentioned um, in the book where I'm talking about um, kind of performance and something I use in, uh, myself when I'm doing it. Um, if you have a more mathematical leaning, this is probably going to be helpful to you. If not, it's some nice graphs and we'll talk through it quickly. So the idea of this is that it shows how um, different scaling magnitudes work. So different uh, orders of scaling. So at the bottom here in our purple line, pinky purple line at the bottom, we can see here that we have uh, a linear scale. So it's the same resource utilization, no matter how many records we put through. It might be that we have a log, uh, log of base two uh, of n. So there's an asymptote. Same with square root of n, there's an asymptote. All of these are absolutely ideal situations. If we can get something like this, our life is very, very good. Because what it means is that as we're using more and more, as we're processing more and more records, there's a limit on the number of resources we're going to be using. And as long as that limit is going to be within our acceptable performance boundaries, within our user's acceptance level, and within the governor limits, we have no problems. O, uh, order of n, or on, is where things scale linearly. So that means that for every one record we add, we increase our resource utilization by an equal amount. Okay? This is fine. It does mean we have a breakpoint we will discover. So for example, if uh, we only had um, 60 units to use here, we would find that when we hit 60, we would break. And that's okay. We can work with that. We can set limits. We can make sure that our users don't break that. It's when we start getting the other side of this line, when we have n log n or n squared, or even worse, two to the n or n factorial scaling. At this point, it means for every one record we add, we use more than one extra unit of resource. Okay. So for example, if I was doing one more record, I would use an extra, you know, uh, or if I was doing two more records, I might use four more resources. That would be an n squared example. Okay, so as I double the size, my usage quadruples. That's a situation which is going to get out of hand very, very quickly. And what I've got here is I've actually got an example from something we'll see in a minute where you can see we have a quadratic scaling. So it's a polynomial scaling because we have a line at this gold line of best fit. And what that's doing is that's saying <coughs> that as we scale our number of records, we're using up more and more resources as we go. So for 500, we're using um, roughly, uh, this is CPU time, so uh, nearly 8,000 milliseconds, whereas for 250, we're only using 2,000. So as we've doubled here, we've quadrupled our resource utilization. That's gonna lead to us having very, very bad problems very, very quickly. So with that, let's start talking about some concrete examples of how we can improve things. So we're gonna start off by talking about loop performance. <laughs> now, your four loops are gonna be a primary source of CPU time consumption, okay? They're gonna be one of those things because of their nature that you're going over a large number of records, you're doing something repeatedly, they're gonna consume a lot of resources. Nested loops are particularly bad because what tends to happen there is as you double the size of the record, you do end up quadrupling the size of the resource utilization because you're running the loop twice, okay? If you have a nested loop, be very, very, very careful of how many records you're processing and what's being used in there. In general, within your loops, you wanna make sure you follow best practices. So no DML in a loop, no SQL in a loop, and avoid any expensive operation in a loop. So something like a, a describe result. Okay, if I was getting the schema description for an account within a loop, that is an expensive bit of Apex to run. And if I'm running that every time and I've got 200 records, I'm running it way too much. That I should move outside, cache that information and then reuse it again, store it in memory and use it again. 
happening. So there's a number of best practices we can follow there. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize when I say no DML and no SOC in loops is, um, is this is not just around the governor limit. So there is the governor limit that we could hit. If you have DML or SOC rule within a for loop, if you are in a trigger, you in particular, you are likely to hit a governor limit as triggers do things in batches of 200 and you have 100 DML statements and, uh, yeah, it's 100 DML statements and 100, 100, 100 SOC rule statements and 150 DML statements, I think it is, if I remember off the top of my head. Um, so that's, that's one thing you're going to hit. The bigger problem you've got is... DML takes time to run. SOC rule takes time to run. Okay, so if you're firing a DML statement, that's then going to run all of your flows, your process builders, your triggers, uh, workflow rules, all of that stuff that's going to go on. It might fire off other save processes, and you've got the full save order of execution occurring. So when we're saying don't do DML in for loops, it's not just to stop you hitting that governor limit because you know there's a good instance where you know I worked on a system recently where we had um, a user that was always going to require to create five records. There was a hard limit of five specific records they had to create, and we had to loop over them and update each record with some data. It was always going to be five. It was a regulatory requirement for this five pieces of information, these five records. We could have done that DML in a for loop because we know it's only over going to be five, and five is a lot less than our limit. However, Every time we ran that DML, all of our triggers fired, workflows, process builders, blah, 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 blah. That full save order of execution, and that takes time. So by moving it out and doing it once, we improve performance, even though we weren't anywhere near a governor limit. Same with Sockle. The Sockle optimizer, we'll talk about in a little bit. It's a wonderful piece of kit, fantastic tool. However, Sockle queries take time. Do one Sockle query rather than doing 100. It's going to make it a lot more, a lot faster regardless of the fact that there's a hundred limit. The other thing to talk about is that different loops have different impacts. So depending upon how you run your for loop depends on what CPU time you're gonna use. And here, we're gonna switch over to a little demo. So on my screen, hopefully, you can see a class called loop performance underscore test. And as I mentioned earlier, let me just zoom in a touch just to make sure it's big enough for everyone. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I like to do when I'm doing performance testing is actually do it in Apex, okay? Write Apex unit tests. The big reason being is that these are super repeatable. I can hit run on this 10, 15, 20 times. I don't have to go into the system. I don't have to manually click around. I can hit it once and it will run it all for me, okay? What we've got here is a... Setup method is going to create some data for us. It's going to create 8,000 accounts with a name of test and then one, two, or zero to eight, uh, seven, nine, nine, nine. So we're going to have 8,000 accounts for our system to work through and look through. We are then going to test in individual tests different types of loops. So the very first one is our standard for loop. But I tell you what, just for speed for when we're doing this in a minute. I'm going to lower this down to 4,000 just so it'll run a bit quicker. So we've got our standard SOC will fall in, and that is down here, and we've got our test that says for account ACK in our query, and all we're doing is we're assigning the name of that to an output variable. We're not doing anything with it. We've just got a statement in there, a very simple statement. Before this, we're taking a stamp for our CPU time, after this, we're taking a stamp for our CPU time, and these are going to give us our measurement points. We're then getting the total by taking the end from the start to give us the difference. And we've got a system.assert here. We've hard-coded it to always fail, so it will always tell me the error, okay? And always tell me the amount. Is it just me using one of the features that the uh, assertion uh, method gives us? Our next one is then um, a for loop with dynamic. Um, Apex, where here, instead of just calling account.name, we're calling account.get and then passing in name, so the API name of our field as a string. And this here is just to show us that, you know, retrieving data differently has a different impact again. Same kind of code for stamping and retrieving the data. We've then got a batched for loop, 
And for those that aren't familiar with the batch for loop, what it does is you tell it to loop over list instances, and it will batch this up into sets of 200, and this inner loop will work on 200 records at a time. We've then got our iterator with an external maximum. And so what I'm doing here is I'm doing my query and storing the results in memory within my method. I'm getting the maximum, so the top point of my iterator for my counter, and I'm doing a more traditional for loop. So the integer i equals zero, i is less than my maximum, i plus plus. And then I've got the same one here, but I'm just calling accounts.size at this point. And this covers off almost every scenario you can have. What I'm just gonna do real quick is I'm just gonna fix this to make sure that we're running the right one. And as you can see here, we've also got some code I use for testing heap size. So this is gonna go away and it's gonna run, create all of our records for us. I'm just gonna hit run now because it'll take a few seconds to run. <coughs> It's going to create these 4,000 accounts, and then all of our tests are going to retrieve them and loop through them. Now, this is really sort of just a, you know, a bit of an illustrative example. But one of the things I want you to bear in mind when we start to see the results here is that this is a kind of, you know, um, a good analogy for real data because we're just showing what the standard setups are going to do, regardless of the complexity. And then B, if we were to do this ourselves, um, I'm going to say, more thoroughly, what we would do is we would take the results we're going to see here and we would run this multiple times. So we would do the same test, run it 15 times, 20 times, 100 times, whatever it needs to be. We'd run it with different values as well to make sure we had a very concrete set of results. We wouldn't just do it once. So if I come down here, what we can see on my account, uh, on my loop performance test is, whoops, let me just expand that. I've got my assertions failing. And you can see here that when I have my external max iterator, I'm using 96 milliseconds. My inline max total, so 96 is being used on uh, this one. So I'm declaring my list and my maximum outside. I then got 97 milliseconds for when I'm just doing it in line every time down here. I then jump up to 223 milliseconds in my SOCOL for loop, which is up here, uh, that one. So my standard SOCOL for loop. I then jump up again to 255 for my dynamic, which is here. So I'm calling act.name. And then I'm up to 374 milliseconds for when I'm doing my batched SOCOL for loop. So when I'm doing it over lists here. Now, again, we would run this test five, six, seven, eight times. Um, probably so I typically run with myself 10 times under 10 different loads to give me you know, 100 data points to average out and measure. Um, but what we can see here is that just changing the way in which we've done our for loop, regardless of you know, what we're actually really doing in the for loop, has an impact on how quick our code runs. Okay? And you know, the difference here is, uh, what's that, about 270 millisecond, uh, milliseconds? That's, you know, a fairly large amount of data. I mean, you know, uh, sorry, fairly large amount of time. You know, that's the sort of thing that Google would really care about if their web page was slower by that much. Now, again, is our user going to notice that? They're probably going to notice that, yes. So we need to be cognizant of that to make sure we're working with it. So what I can do is if I jump back over here, I can show you this example that I put together. So this was running it on 5,000 records. Um, and I did this uh, a while ago and to make sure I had a concrete set of data, I think I ran the tests uh, 10 times. And you can see here that my iterator, so that's just the standard, uh, what was maxed external iterator a minute ago, but that kind of uh, for i equals zero, i is less than i plus plus. It is roughly a 10th, let's just call it nearly 10% of the time that it took for our batched for loop to run, okay? That's a, a massive difference, okay? Now, is this me saying, therefore, that every loop you write, you should write as that format? You should you know, have it as being for i is less than blah, 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 i plus plus. No, because one of the things you have to remember is it's a balancing act, 
So lowering the usage of one resource is typically going to increase the usage of another. And what we're trying to find here is the least worst case. So it's the case that's going to give us the best overall setup. Now, this is going to vary what that best overall setup is for every different scenario that we're working in. Okay? There's not going to be a blanket set of rules that you say always write your loops in this way. So you'll notice in that code I had a second ago that I also stored the heap size because what I've done separately is gone and run the numbers for that. And what you can see here is that whilst my CPU time was much, much better for the iterator, my heap size is much, 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 much worse. Now, earlier on, I mentioned to you that, you know, a heap size is a good example of something that the user doesn't care about. Now here, is our user going to care about this? No. Are they going to notice that their code, that their page has come back possibly 0.2 seconds faster? Maybe not perceptibly, but it'll be noticeable, especially if you were to add in a lot of other code around that and other different loops. Do we, as developers, need to worry about this? So in this very contrived example, probably not. This is 245 kilobytes, OK? We have uh, a you know, much bigger limit of six megabytes worth of heap size. So we're not going to be anywhere near that. So we, you know, we're less than, less than, well, we're basically a quarter of a megabyte, which means that we're you know, about a 24th of what we need to be. So we've got lots and lots of headroom. So for us here, this isn't something that we would need to worry about. But the important thing is that this is a very simplistic code example for us to look at. Now, a number of years back, I wrote um, a machine learning system in Apex that myself and former colleague of mine, Jen Wire, uh, she and I wrote the system together and presented it at Dreamforce. And when we were doing that, we were doing lots and lots of iterations and lots and lots of loops over lots and lots of data to build the neural network in Apex. For that, our iterator worked perfectly. We were loading in, yes, we had a lot of data in memory, but it was really just numbers. Um, and it was going to be in there whether it was for our iterator or not. We wanted to churn through that, update those numbers, and then output them at the other end. So our inline for loop here worked really well. Another situation I was in more recently was where I had a lot of records coming in that had uh, large text fields on there. So in this example code, the only thing I'm retrieving is the name field. And the name field is not what I'm going to call a heavy field on a record. It's a very lightweight piece of data. If I were retrieving name and description and type and maybe a URL, an email field, you know, some numbers and other bits of data like that, some dates, suddenly those records increase in size dramatically. And as they increase in size dramatically, they're going to take up more space on our heap as they take up more space on our heap, we then have to worry about it more. So key thing to remember here is that it is a balancing act. You know, I've shown a lot of people this data before and a lot of people say, great, I'm gonna write all my, all my loops in this manner. And you shouldn't, you definitively shouldn't. Um, I personally think that this is the nicest to read. I find this very, very easy for me to read and is my default go-to for when I'm writing loops. But if I'm writing a loop that has a large number of complex calculations inside the loop, I might think about rewriting it in a different way. If I'm writing a loop that has a large volume of data with complex data on the objects, I might think about doing it as a batched for loop to help me manage heap size in that way. All of these have different use cases. All of them have different kind of sweet points, but by taking these measurements, you'll be able to know what those sweet points are. So now that we've looked at Loops, let's talk about Sockle. So Sockle, as I mentioned a minute ago, is one of those other big areas where you can take up a lot of time in your transaction. And the query optimizer is going to go away and try and make things as quick as possible for you. But there are a few ways you can improve your Sockle performance in your Apex transaction. The first of which is to just run fewer queries. I know that sounds very, very simplistic and obvious, but it's worth reiterating. Run fewer queries. If you can get data from a parent and child in one, get data from a parent and child in one. Saying that though, that is then going to impact your heap size. So as we've just discussed, 
improving one query impact, uh, sorry, improving one resource usage can impact another. So you need to measure and make sure you're okay with that. You should cache results in memory wherever possible to reuse them. It's fairly obvious. And we've seen that, as we mentioned, you know, things like um, sort of doing a loop within a, a query within a loop, do it outside of the loop and, you know, loop through it to process the data. Um, but the biggest thing that you can do that a lot of people aren't aware of is to ensure your queries are selective. And so that means index, index filters. So when you're doing a where clause, use an indexed filter. When you're setting up your org, set up some strict sharing. Make sure that sharing is enforced. That will limit the number of records that people could query against and improve things. And if in doubt, add a limit on your query. Only retrieve a certain number of rows. You know, limit the amount of data you're getting back just to ensure that you don't have to worry about it. So if I hop over here again, what I've got is I've got a series of queries here that I just want to talk through quickly. And one of the things I want to show you is the Salesforce query plan tool. And there's a lot of developers that I find haven't worked with this. So when you enter uh, into the developer console, let me just make that a little bit bigger again. When you go into the developer console, you can enable, and I think if I remember correctly, it is in preferences, and you can enable the query plan tool here by setting that to true. When you do that, you'll get this extra little button here called query plan. If you enter a query and hit query plan, you'll get this very interesting looking table pop up. And what this table is going to do is it's going to tell you the cardinality of your query. So that's how many records are going to be returned, the fields that are being used in the operation it's describing, the leading operation type for those fields, the cost of doing that operation, the cardinality of the records returned from that operation, and which object it's against. So the cost here is the thing that's probably the most kind of obscure, but also important. So the cost here is a number. We want that number to be below one. If that number is above one, our query is not selective. Here, as it's above two, what that's saying to us is it's literally going through the database and going through every record line by line to work on them. There's no indexing or selectivity at all. So that's without any filters on there. What if I look now at adding some filters using some pick lists. So I've got type and I've got industry. I hit query plan here. You can see that again, it is gonna go through and it's gonna tell me that this is a bit more of a performant query because I at least now have some filters, but the leading operation is still a table scan. It's still having to go through all of the database and check every row. Our fields are not indexed, so they're not usable and it's just going to return data for us, okay? So that's the next option. The final one we're going to look at is if we use an indexed field. So an index field is something like an ID or a name or a unique field that we've marked. And what you can see here is we've got another row that tells us we've got our cardinality is much reduced, so we're returning two rows. And we're using the ID field here with an index operation type. And that has a cost of 0.05. So whilst it is gonna go and search all 126 records because we don't have, I'm a system admin in this org, it's a dev org, we don't have any sharing set up. That is a really low cost search for us, okay? And that will mean that our query is much more performant. So again, when we're doing queries, make sure we're using an index field Make sure you've got your sharing enforced. Add a limit if you don't have a selective index, but almost always have a selective index. The best one to use is always ID. If you can retrieve things using a record ID, you will have performant queries. If you can then do that by reducing the number of queries you have as well, you should be fine and safe and gold. Actually getting to 101 queries to blow that governor limit is, requires a lot of work to be done. Um, but having five really, really inefficient queries will slow you down massively. And again, that's user perceived performance. It's one of those things that a lot of people don't think about is that when it's running a query, if it's sat there churning away on the query for 300, 400 milliseconds, that's adding 300, 400 milliseconds on 
to your transaction time and it's your user sat there twiddling their thumbs. So the other thing I wanted to talk about and show you um, briefly is caching and the platform cache. So caching is really, really important. It's keeping data in memory or available to you for easy access rather than querying it again. And the platform cache is a temporary data store that is built for frequently accessed but seldom written data. It's a fairly new feature. I think it's the uh, past couple of years it was out. Really great tool. A lot of people not aware of it, a lot of people not using it. You have two types of platform cache. There is an org-wide one that everyone can use. And there is a session cache that is tied to your user session. In a session cache, you log out or your session ends, the cache disappears. We should look at using this whenever we have read often or write infrequently um, items or whenever we have an async jump, okay? So um, an exchange rate is a good example of something that we read often, but write infrequently. So typically we would write it once every five to 10 minutes, um, but we would read it more often than that. For an async jump, um, I was working on a system recently where we had an integration to an external tool, uh, but it was connected to that tool through a community. So the user logged in onto a community, took an action, there was an update, updated the external system, the external system did its thing, and then separately it would then push an update into Salesforce that the user could then read on a different record. That time between that processing and that push happening, we didn't know and we didn't have a control over. So what we would do is we would overwrite the value by putting it into a cache, used as a session cache, and that would be what we would try and retrieve first of all. If we couldn't retrieve it, we would then go and get the actual value from the database. I just want to talk you through some code here that actually does this. So let me move the, uh, where's my mouse gone? My mouse gonna show up, there we are. Um, I'm just gonna move the uh, zoom bar. So here we have an example um, class called cache examples. I'm very, very inventive with my naming. Um, and what we're doing is we're caching a foreign exchange rate and it's a rate and a pairing. So it might be GBP to USD. K is our pairing, and it's the exchange rate for that. We have a method here we call cache.org.put, and that's going to take a string name for the cache we want to place things in. So here we're doing local.fxrate.pairing, and that's saying you know, the GBP USD uh, slot in our FX rate session cache for local use because we can package these and have different namespaces. And then we have retrieve where it's going to go and do a get. So it's a little bit like um, having it as a map. So we're just putting and retrieving from a map. This value here is the time to live for that before it gets cleared out. The uh, FX retriever, rate retriever class we have here, this is what would be going out to, I don't know, Google Finance, Yahoo Finance, XE.com, whatever, to retrieve our um, exchange rate, but we're just returning a random number here. And I've got some examples here. So the top example to talk through first of all is where I have my pairing. I go away and I retrieve my rate. So it just gives me that random number. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to cache that by putting my rate in for that pairing. And that will call this put method here and put it in. And then my test, I just retrieve it from that cache just to check that it has cached it. And this is just me showing that the cache works. Okay. And if we run that test, it'll run in the background quite nice and quickly and easily for us. And we will see that, uh, oh, it has failed. Why has it failed in there? Probably because I've been messing with this data beforehand. Okay, we'll jump on in a second. Secondly, we have another example here where what we are doing is we are retrieving our org partition. So retrieving the uh, cache partition we want to work with. And then what we're going to do is we're going to call get on that cache partition. And we're going to get our pairing, but we're going to pass in this class instance for us to work with. Okay. And when we pass in this class instance, it's this special class I've written here that implements cache.cachebuilder. And what that's going to do is if no value exists in our cache, it's going to call this FX rate retriever, and it's going to populate it for us. And so I've evidently updated something here that means that the test is going to fail for us. 
um, and is returning should be not equal to null, but it is returning null. So I'll have to look into that. So apologies that I've probably updated that as this is sample code from uh, the book I was messing around with on another one. But the important thing we have here is this cache builder is a nice feature we can use in there so that as we want to start building out that cache, we can just build it out in real time as we need to. We don't need to add things in that aren't required. So platform cache is a really useful tool. And again, will help you get data in and out of the platform really quickly and easily without having to make queries. And so I know we're approaching time, um, but the last, last thing to cover off quickly is the idea of asynchronicity and architecture. So one of the things you can do when you're thinking about improving performance is synchronous versus asynchronous. And this is a big architectural decision as well. Key question you need to ask is, does this need to be done now? When you're working with something, does this action need to occur immediately or not? You also have to ask, do all of the parts of this need to happen now or not? You can also then ask, what else needs to happen after this event occurs? The reason you can ask these questions, it allows you to decide when you can start to make things occur and whether you can add in a delay and if it's gonna matter. If it doesn't matter, you then have all the options for asynchronous processing to work with. They'll help you separate out your system and it will increase the performance of your initial code, making it quicker for the user. So by moving that processing out onto another Apex transaction and effectively another thread, your initial one decreases in size and scope and so therefore it'll return faster for the user and they'll notice a perceived performance improvement. So you've got a lot of options for asynchronous processing on Salesforce, so future, scheduled, batch, queuable web services and platform events. A really good example here is um, I was working with a customer where every time there was a sale that completed, it was a B2C customer, anytime there was a sale that completed, they wanted to send them and add them, you know, create a user and add them to a community. That didn't need to happen immediately. A, it couldn't happen immediately because of mixed DML, but B, it didn't need to happen exactly as that user hit the sell button and that opportunity got updated. It just needed to happen near real time. Because it was sending an email out, there was always gonna be a delay. And so what we did was we used platform events to have an event that fires once that opportunity is closed. We could then hang on to that event in a trigger and have it do things like create our user, or we could have other endpoints that we're holding on to and listening out for that platform event as well. So thinking about how you can make some of your system synchronous and asynchronous will also help you improve performance um, as you go forward. A key thing I wanna make sure um, I reiterate to everyone is just to keep on ongoing review. Okay, always keep measuring, always keep tweaking. It should be part of your release, uh, release cadence to allow you to add improvements to your next release, okay? Your system's never gonna be perfect. It's never gonna be completely done. As such, you wanna make sure that you're adding improvements as you go. And if you make this part of your release cadence, you'll be more uh, comfortable with the release, you know, comfortable that nothing's gonna break down, but also know what you need to focus on next time. Today's solution is often gonna be tomorrow's problem. Um, I cannot count the number of times I've built a solution that works perfectly there and then, and six months later, business requirements change, systems need to adapt, and you know uh, that work needs to get rid of, okay? Deleting it, changing it, removing it, that's fine. We have to be aware that our code needs to adapt and our system needs to change. It's also worth remembering that perfect is very much the enemy of good. If you can get a solution that works, scales, and is performant, even if it isn't a perfect solution, and you know you're gonna end up having to update it, having it work for your users is always gonna be most important, okay? We need to be pragmatic about what we're doing here. And finally, keep an eye on the release notes. Um, over the 13 years I've worked with Salesforce, they have very kindly upped most of the limits as we've been going. Um, there's going to be new features as well that will help you scale, so platform cache, platform events, things like that. Don't be afraid to rework something for the better as well. Yeah. Don't hold on to something just because it's been there for years and has worked. If there's a better way of doing it, do it because it will save you a headache further on. And the very final thought, um, you know, you can't have a presentation without an XKCD quote um, or image. So in, uh, in 
in the book when I'm talking about performance, um, I reference this Donald Knuth quote. And for those who aren't familiar with Donald Knuth, he is one of the most seminal computer scientists that has ever lived. I wrote a very good series of books called The Art of Computer Programming. Um, and in there, he said that uh, we should forget about small efficiencies, say 97% of the time. And it's very often quoted, just the next part, premature optimization is the root of all evil. And then goes on to say, yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. Do not sit there and spend time optimizing and trying to get it down to, you know, shave off another 100 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds, or, you know, use one less query or something if it's not adding value, okay? What's going to add value to the business? What's going to add value to your customer has to be your primary driver. However, do this performance monitoring, do this performance measurement, and you'll be able to find out how you can best ensure that you can continue to add value and that your solution will continue to add value as you scale, okay? Don't try and optimize everything. You're never going to get everything perfect, but make sure you're aware of where the problems are and that you fix them so that you can get things to be good. And with that, um, as I mentioned, if you want to find me on uh, Twitter, I'm at P. Batterson. Um, I use that on GitHub and everywhere else. Uh, if you want to look for me there, again, Cloudbytes TV, there's a few YouTube videos, including some going through the loops uh, stuff. that are a few years old now. Um, and yeah, if you are interested in more about performance and a deeper dive into some of this, have a look at that Mastering Apex Programming book available at Amazon and everywhere else. And uh, yeah, um, I'm happy to take any questions if we have any. Go through the chat. Uh, can we get access to the code shown in the demo to play around? It is up, up online already. Um, let me find it in the background now and I will share it with you. Um, one second. Uh, but yes, the code is all available online. Um, you just, uh, let me just find it for you and I'll share the link. What other questions do we have? Um, do, 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 where are we? So the code is all available there in that link I've just posted. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that was a question. Um, so what questions have we got? Uh, I'm able to hear the audio. Do, 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 um, from the performance perspectives, are there any best practices for your data model? If so, please share. So when it comes to your data model, um, some best practices are in terms of performance are, you know, think about some of the declarative features like uh, cross-object formulas and cross-object workflow. Um, number of times you can save yourself doing a parent-child query by just having something pulled through onto the child um, from the parent using a formula field or cross-object workflow. You know, is, is uncountable. Um, that's a really good one. Uh, the sharing model, sharing model and permissions model have a massive uh, performance impact. And with that, um, on your data model, be aware of the sharing implications of your different relationship types. So a lot of people um, don't realize that if you have a master detail relationship, you get inherited sharing, whereas with lookup, you don't. Because you don't with lookup, you then have two different sharing models that you could in. Uh, put in place, which can speed up things, but then you may have to do different queries for them. Um, so yeah, data model, it's really around making sure that you're, um, you know, utilizing some of the uh, standard features. Uh, other things, limit field sizes, you know, don't stick everything in a big rich text area. Um, I've worked with a number of organizations where they have lots and lots of rich text areas with thousands and thousands of uh, fields on them. Not always a great practice. Um, Standard normalization and denormalization practices um, to help out. Um, yeah, things like that will typically help you kind of avoid a lot of the big gotchas. Um, again, in queries, just retrieve the data you need. Um, one of the things I hate is um, I work with some places where they have these big data wrapper classes where it you know, has a single method to retrieve all the data. No, just retrieve the fields you need at the time you need them. Don't query for everything. That's going to waste time and space. Um, Hopefully that helps and gives you some ideas, uh, Krish. Um, so another question here, on the CPU limits and heap size, are there any performance benchmarks published for the Salesforce platform or for user request processing on experience card? Um, no, there are not, as far as I'm aware. 
Um, I do remember many, many moons ago, and I don't know if Amit can ever remember this picture. There was a picture that they had of the Salesforce platform, you know, the kind of architecture slide. And on there, it did say that queries were done in under 300 milliseconds. I can't find that picture anywhere, but I'm pretty sure it still holds true. Um, so don't quote me on that one, not an official statement. Um, but there isn't anything that's published out there on performance terms. It's really kind of avoiding the governor limits. Because it's a multi-tenant platform, I'm pretty sure Salesforce wouldn't publish something like that. Um, how can we resolve the 101 SQL query issue? Um, do fewer queries is, I'm afraid, the only real answer. So um, some of the things I mentioned uh, above around you know, using standard features to retrieve data on your child from your parents, um, bits like that can help you resolve those issues. But typically, it's either separate things out into different transactions because you're going to need to, or um, just do fewer queries by batching queries together and process them, processing them in memory. Um, access to the code was shown. Da, 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 da. Any suggestion for better performance of a transaction that has many process builder or flow automations? Um, so Cecilia, you've asked the, the, the question that I was hoping to avoid. So um, flow and process builder and performance. Now flow and process builder um, are not as performant as Apex code. And I'm gonna say the phrase in general. Um, this is one of those things where people get very, very heated, very, very angry and upset. Um, process Builder and Flow are abstractions of programming. They are not programming by themselves. Um, if you write a good bit of Apex, it will be better than a good bit of Flow in general, is my kind of uh, view on it. Um, and there, I think Christian, it was Christian Sandor Knapp did a really good breakdown of the different performance um, for the different ones in there. Um, if you're in a situation where you're in an org where there's a lot of flows, a lot of process builders um, and a lot of triggers, review them all and decide to try and use one tool. Um, now the benefit of Salesforce is you can do declarative and programmatic together. We don't wanna get away from that. However, um, you're gonna end up finding that you have recursion going on and all sorts of things like that that you don't. So uh, what I tend to do is I tend to draw these things out on a swim lane diagram to see how things are overlapping and what's going in between the different tools. I look at the or save order of execution and how things might be causing recursion. And then what I would do is I would look at where it makes sense to put things in. So if you have both uh, before save trigger record, before, uh, before record save trigger, uh, before uh, flows that are before save, I, can, I can't get that out today. You have before save flows and before triggers, use one or the other, okay? They're just gonna end up duplicating time and effort. Um, you're retrieving the same data and working on the same data. So maybe use one or the other as you go forward. Um, it's a gradual process. There's no easy answer to it. And I wouldn't ever sell it, say to anyone, don't use all of the tools at your disposal, but know that as you start to have them overlap, you're going to get more problems and it is like cause government issues. Um, how to test the performance for an async call as it depends upon so many parameters like network server responses. So for an asynchronous call out, for you doing a HTTP call out to uh, another web server, um, so I would suggest that you test that using something like Postman and maybe something like, um, oh, what's the load tool I'm on about? Um, it's Storm. There's a load testing tool where you can test uh, load test HTTP uh, responses. Now, in terms of performance on the Salesforce side, you know you you have to wait for the response from the server um, from the other server. Salesforce isn't going to be your limitation in that. They have a very very big internet pipe um, to allow them to talk to people, um, as does most other providers. So I think if you're doing async calls like that, um, key things are minimize your um, minimize the amount of data you're sending back and forth, minimize the processing you're doing and do the processing in the best way. So often, for example, um, if you're sending and receiving JSON data that you then want to display to the user, just take that data and push it straight down into a Lightning Web component. JavaScript parsing JSON is much faster than Apex parsing JSON. Okay, it'll just be easier to work with. Um, 
have I compared future versus platform event performance? Um, I've seen that platform events should behave in a more manageable manner. So um, I've not compared the two because I think the two have different use cases. Um, but platform events, platform events are near real time and are aimed to be near real time. So your, your receipt of the event should be quicker than necessarily a future event firing, which is based upon platform load. So they have different use cases and have different architectures. Um, if you are wanting to connect pieces of a system in near real time, platform events are the way to go. If you want to run uh, kind of like a, I mean, I think of a platform, um, I think a future method is almost like functions as a service on Apex. So if you have a little function that doesn't need to return anything, that can go away and do its job, then a great way of doing that is future methods. So they're not, they're not super comparable in that way. And um, there's slightly different use cases, but I think I know I hope that helps uh, Fabrice and kind of give some give some information. Um, is there an Apex class or method that can get the URL of a public community page? Um, no, not that I'm aware of because uh, Apex is running on a server um, and community pages are all client-based. What you can do is if you've got a Lightning Web component, you can just get window.location. You could pass that up into your Apex method if you want. Um, and how do we approach organization for a project which has having 1300 classes in complex logic implemented. Um, slowly and methodically um, is the answer there, Nilesh. So what I would do um, is I would, I mean, if you have 13, over 1300 classes in log, uh, complex logic, you've likely got, um, you've, being honest, you've probably got a lot of stuff you don't need. Um, you, so something like, um, what I would suggest doing is to sit down and look at what the most used pieces of functionality are. Okay, so what are your end users? So again, going back to the very start here, what are your end users doing and focusing on? What's most important to them? If they're using one Lightning Web component, one page, or you know, one series of classes, 10 times or 100 times more than the others, focus on those classes and improving them, and then work your way through the system. Um, Trigger handlers, always a great area to focus on improvement on because they're going to take time every time there's a save. So I would focus on those key areas first. Um, but yeah, with 1300 classes, definitely have a look at what you've got and if there's enough reuse of code going on and how you might refactor some of them together. Um, if you, so I mentioned that I do this in Apex unit testing. One of the things um, you might want to do is to separate out your Apex unit test for this into a different code repository and just push that into certain environments to run against there. Um, you could even package it um, if you wanted to do to make that easier. But uh, yeah, that would be kind of my advice is to separate this out, focus on those key areas first. So classes that are most used because of uh, UI involvement and then trigger handler classes and then look at your integration classes and then start to work your way through there. Hopefully that helps. Um, the load testing tool is load runner. No, I, oh, um, it begins with a B and it will come to me literally as we dial out of this call, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I'll keep on thinking about it in the back of my head. Um, uh, index performance. I'm not sure what that question is, Sachin, or what that means. Um, all index fields versus index with unindexed ones, performance as SQL and heap. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, if you're on about whether it's better to have all index fields with indexed versus indexed with unindexed ones, um, you just need an index field. Um, if you have multiple index fields, SOC will, uh, force.com query optimizer will choose the best uh, index for you to use and it'll work through them like that, okay? Um, and I think, um, I think that is it in terms of questions. If there's any more, let me know. Um, but Amit, thank you once again for having me along. Um, it's been really, really interesting. I hope people have found it useful. Thank you so much, Paul. This session is really great. And I hope our, com uh, our, lot, our community member learned a lot. So please don't forget to subscribe our YouTube channel to get the recording. We'll share the recording very soon.
please follow our website to get the notification of any blog post or any session by the email. So if you follow whatever the future session we have, you will get an email directly in your inbox. And thank you so much, everyone, for the joining us. Don and Paul, thank you so much for giving uh, your knowledge and sharing your knowledge with our uh, Apex Hour group. No, thank you very much again for having me. It's been really good. And uh, yeah, if anyone has any more questions afterwards, yeah, again.